7 Nightly News with Peter Mitchell. A yachtsman's joy, Raphael Donelli celebrates his safe return, but hopes fade for his missing English rival. Fishermen jump for their lives as a light plane crashes on their runabout. And a Richmond mum's surprise footpath delivery. Good evening. Also tonight, some good news for workers about the Australia Day holiday. First, another setback as rescuers close in on two lone sailors shipwrecked in the Southern Ocean. Deteriorating weather has forced the postponement of a helicopter mission as hopes fade for Englishman Tony Bullimore. But as John Vaughan reports, French yachtsman Thierry Dubois could be picked up as early as tomorrow morning. Survivor, this is Orion. Uh, outlook for next two days, weather will be good. Yes, weather will be okay, and uh, ship is en route to pick you up. First contact with Thierry Dubois. Despite his terrible ordeal, the Frenchman is coping well and in good spirits. With pinpoint accuracy, the RAAF drops supplies and a special radio. He's got it, he's got it, man. They maintained contact for several hours. It's very cold, it's very windy, and there were absolutely terrible conditions, so uh, he's done incredibly well. The weather's been so bad, his first life raft sank. We dropped two more dinghies, he got into one of those, he looked quite safe and happy, and then the wind was so severe it overturned him again. His rescue is now just over 12 hours away. HMAS Adelaide is travelling at almost full speed, and weather permitting, a helicopter will set out at first light tomorrow morning. We will maintain airborne contact with you until the ship arrives. But there's now real concern for Englishman Tony Bullimore. There's been no sign of him. The emergency beacon on board his capsized yacht is no longer working. It's hoped he's still in an airtight compartment on board his boat, but may not know help is at hand. Sonar devices and sound boys have been dropped nearby. An emergency beacon will ring out to alert Mr Bullimore a search is underway. The Navy's biggest ship, HMAS Westralia, will set out from Perth in the next few hours to refuel the Adelaide. At least the weather has been favourable overnight. Winds were just 20 knots, seas only 3 metres. But that's expected to change as a front moves through later tonight. John Vores, 7 Nightly News. As the desperate rescue bid for the two shipwrecked sailors intensifies, the Frenchman who cheated death in the same area 11 days ago finally set foot on dry land. Raphael Donelli arrived in Hobart with fellow sailor Peter Goss, who plucked him from a life raft minutes before his yacht sank. Mike Amor was with the welcoming flotilla. Aquacorum, the boat that captured world attention, arrived under the spotlight of a large media flotilla, much to the surprise of an exhausted skipper, Pete Goss. Did you expect this type of welcome? The man he rescued, Frenchman Raphael Donelli, made a brief appearance on deck, only wanting to do an interview for French television. The round-the-world yacht was then towed along the Derwent River into Hobart. Bond D Globe Race rules prevent it from docking or being boarded. No one's allowed on the boat and I'm not allowed off, so I can't have a beer, which is a shame. I'm going to do a few jobs to the boat and then I'm high tailing off back down the Southern Ocean and round Cape Horn, over. Finally, Raphael Donelli's nightmare was over. A hug of gratitude for the man who saved his life, followed by a meeting with custom officials. Raphael, welcome to Australia. Thanks a lot. The 28-year-old later described how for almost two days he stood on the deck of his sinking yacht, almost convinced his distress signal had not been heard. Finally, when he thought death was just minutes away, an RAAF plane dropped a life raft. Uh, when the plane uh, full my, uh, my life raft, uh, 10 minutes after my boat sinking. You know, he needed nursing for about three or four days and so on, but then he's got his strength back now and it's great, yeah. His arrival has also reignited a chorus of criticism of the man who cost Australian taxpayers several hundred thousand dollars. To add salt to the wound, it's believed he's also received 50000 from a French TV station. Money, he's adamant, won't be given to the Australian government. When questioned, the Frenchman had trouble with his English. Mike Amor, 7 Nightly News. CFA volunteers who battled a massive tyre blaze near Western Port Bay have been urged to undergo health checks. The fear that they've been exposed to toxic fumes because some of the firefighters weren't using breathing gear. 
This video footage has shocked the firefighters union and senior officers. It shows CFA volunteers right in the thick of highly toxic smoke from burning tyres without breathing equipment. Absolutely horrified. I mean the sheer hypocrisy of the CFA is that last week they were in the media saying they wouldn't put firefighters at risk. Here we have footage uh, of firefighters being put in an extremely dangerous position. Experts say the area should have been evacuated and breathing apparatus mandatory for everyone attending. Horrified because of the ramifications further down the track, the injuries that could have occurred. Breathing gear was available. A van carrying at least 30 kits and capable of refilling dozens of cylinders was on scene. Despite that, in some instances, one person was using a safety mask while the next firefighter wasn't. In this case, an entire team smothered as they battled to roll out hoses. The union fears volunteers who didn't take precautions may suffer serious health problems. Go and get a medical. Get a medical today, not next week, not a month. Although no one would appear on camera, CFA management say they've not received any complaints about the crib point fire and they've rated the operation an outstanding success. The union says it'll write to CFA command urging an inquiry. Steve Kerry, Seven Nightly News. Two fishermen in a dinghy had to jump for their lives when a light plane crashed in a ball of flame just metres from them. The pilot was killed when the single-engine Cessna struck power lines near a remote airstrip in far north Queensland. Witnesses say the plane bounced towards the fisherman's dinghy in a farm dam before bursting into flames. The anglers were shaken by their experience but were uninjured. Confusion tonight for Victorian workers who are trying to find out if they're entitled to an Australia Day long weekend. Kelly Russell explains that award uncertainties now mean individual bosses could decide whether it will be business as usual on Monday, January the 27th. Premier Jeff Kennett, always keen to promote Victoria on the move, launched a tram painted to mark the nation's birthday. But he's always been a strong opponent of taking a public holiday which doesn't fall on January 26th. And that happens this year when all states except Victoria have declared Monday a public holiday. But as Victorians move from state to federal awards, it means they should enjoy the long weekend with the rest of Australia. Those who are not on the federal award, it'll be a matter of personal choice as to whether they take it up or not. The only hitch is that the Victorian move hasn't been ratified in the Industrial Relations Commission and that means employers can still ignore the holiday. From a legal point of view, perhaps they're not required to do that. They simply will make that pragmatic decision. It's quite a confused situation overall. Employer groups say workers not covered by a federal award will have to either negotiate for the day off or wait until their employer decides whether or not they'll have to turn up for work. Kelly Russell, Seven Nightly News. Imagine getting a phone bill for almost $17,000. That's what's happened to a Glenroy man this month. Telstra admits it's a mistake and blames human error for the bungle. Alan Hayes and his family usually make only three local calls a day. Imagine Alan's shock when his last two monthly bill came to $16,921. I felt really sick when I opened it up and seen that amount. The bill accounts for 71,014 local calls. That's 1,183 a day, 49 an hour, 24 hours a day. After Alan complained, he was told to ignore it, but a disconnection bill arrived demanding the money. But the faith I've lost is now, I don't know what they're going to say is my phone bill. Telstra admits it was human error. The system detected that there was a problem. Sadly though, some human error meant that the bill was sent when it really should have been stopped and manually corrected. Alan Hayes' bill may be a one-off, but the telecommunications ombudsman has called on Telstra to expand its itemised billing system to include local calls to restore public confidence. We're introducing a system that will allow local calls to be itemised as well, and that's basically come as a result of consultation with our customers. Telstra may be off the hook, but Alan Hayes plans to frame the bill as a ringing reminder. Lena Keneva, Seven Nightly News. A Richmond couple has delivered their baby daughter in very public circumstances, on the footpath outside their home. Dean Alan Craig explains. Tiny Khadija Besanson is resting peacefully after her rushed arrival on the Richmond Terrace footpath. It happened very fast, didn't it? Very fast. I knew it was going to be an event, but... That much was too much. <laughs> the couple almost made it to the car, but suddenly knew it was too late. 
The second strong contraction, the baby was here. Neighbours were swept up in the emotion. They crying at the baby. baby. They crying at the mommy. Uh, and me crying at the top. Olympic hockey gold medalist Nova Peris was one of the first neighbours to help. He was a bit shocked, but he was happy. All he could say was, my little girl, my little girl. So that was, you know, that was beautiful. Ambulance officers say it's lucky there were no complications and say by the time they arrived, there was little more to do than cut the cord and take the family to hospital. Unreal, because I haven't been to any training courses. I was a bit slack on that. I didn't believe in them. I always thought it was a natural thing. And uh, as natural as that, it just doesn't come any better than that. Dean Allen Craig, Seven Nightly News. Still to come, the monarchy debate, why England wants the royals but no King Charles. And for drivers, the latest progress report on our CityLink tunnels. If those southeastern arterial traffic snarls are getting you down, don't despair. Work on the new CityLink tunnels is well ahead of schedule. Kate Davies has been given a first-hand look at the massive earthworks going on metres below the city. They're burrowing under in a Melbourne at a rate of knots in Tunnel Talk 700 truckloads a week, representing 65 metres of excavation. At the South Melbourne Westgate Freeway end, they've already reached St Kilda Road and heading towards the Botanic Gardens. At ground level, the lid will soon close over and by April, Grant Street will be a pedestrian-friendly residential and arts precinct. Motorists can expect St Kilda Road traffic to return to normal by the end of this month but many will be unaware of this enormous two-storey cavity created between the road level and the top roof of the tunnel. During the bidding stages, Transfield looked at developing the area but found that financially it was unviable. But that doesn't stop other interested parties from buying the space. Theatres, shops and car parks were some of the ideas considered. To build something within it, um, there would have to be obvious strengthening works, new floors, etc. would have to be built. The tunnel, along with its electronic toll system, should be open to traffic in mid-1999. Kate Davies, Seven Nightly News. Racehorse owners are calling for a boycott of senior jockeys if they continue to threaten strike action. Darren Linton reports the attack comes as the state's leading riders prepare for a mass meeting tonight over their pay claim. While the jockey's attention turned to the Yarragling Cup, Nick Collum fired a broadside at the state's top hoops, calling them greedy and describing their push for a 100% rise in riding fees as ill-conceived. Some of them haven't ridden a winner for three or four years. They're getting the same amount of money for riding our horse as is the top jockey. Following last Saturday's jockey strike, he's called for owners to use apprentices, leaving senior jockeys without rides or income, and he believes many are already overpaid. Absolutely. Some jockeys are probably not worth $70 a race, is what we're saying, but we've never questioned it. Well, every time we go out there, our neck's on the line, and that's a fact. And I think you should really realise that. The Jockeys Association hopes to resolve the pay dispute during negotiations on Thursday, and the tip is the fee for a losing ride will rise from $70 to $100. If talks fail, more strikes could follow. Darren Linton, 7 Nightly News. In a first for the United Kingdom, the royal family has been the subject of a live TV debate. But despite wide support for the monarchy, Prince Charles was the big loser. More than two million viewers took part in the historic poll. 34% believe the royals have had their day. 66% still want a monarchy. But it was damning news for Charles. The studio audience used coloured cards to vote on whether he should be king. It looks like no. The audience also gave Queen Camilla the thumbs down, many preferring to see Prince William take the throne. Two young men have been rescued after 27 days on a life raft in the Pacific. The pair were fishing off Hawaii when their boat sank. After running out of food and water, they carved goodbye messages into their paddles before finally being rescued by another fisherman. And Richard Branson's hopes of becoming the first person to fly a hot air balloon around the world look set to end in failure. The British tycoon left Morocco yesterday, but he's already having technical problems. The balloon is expected to make a forced landing in North Africa this evening. To finance and the All Ordinaries jumped more than 14 points today on the back of New York's near record high. But gold continued to slide and the Aussie dollar slipped below 79 US cents. 
And from Canberra, a silly season political football with Hawthorne taking time off training for some power play. Shadow Treasurer Gareth Evans took the Hawks on a tour of Parliament House, showing them where political muscles are flexed. The Hawks became the centre of attention in the chamber as they joined school children and tourists on a summer holiday stroll along the hallowed hallways of power. There were no politicians on the job, but put this team in suits, and who knows? Well, they wouldn't be the first Hawk to make it to the top job. Sport now with Jim Wilson and Jim. The big guns hit out at Kuyong. Yes, Mitch, Boris Becker and Pete Sampras in great form while the Aussies put their poor one-day form behind them during a charity match at Port Arthur. <music> Australian captain Mark Taylor has vowed to fight his way back through a form slump which had him toying with the idea of dropping himself back to Shield cricket. Today, Taylor and his men put yesterday's fifth straight loss behind them to play in a charity match in Port Arthur. And we seem to have a bit of a technical problem there. Let's go into the tennis. We'll come back to the cricket, if time permits. The big names have sounded ominous warnings for next week's Ford Australian Open on day one of the Colonial Classic at Kuyong. Defending Open champion Boris Becker was too good for Andre Medvedev, while world number one Pete Sampras also won in straight sets against Michael Stick. Other winners today, Michael Chang, while the Jim courier Yevgeny Kafelnikov match is still in progress. The star-studded eight-man field has won over $102 million in prize money alone. First up on Kuyong Centre Court, Pistol Pete Sampras against Germany's Michael Stick, who gained the early service break, only to slip soon after and sustain a hip injury. He managed to continue, but Sampras turned things around in the opening set, winning it in 27 minutes, six games to four. Shot. Sampras has made it clear the Classic is vital in the lead-up to next week's Ford Australian Open, and his form today suggests he'll take some beating at Melbourne Park. That's out and that's match. Sampras. With his security entourage watching on, our lean and mean Boris Becker stepped onto centre court and was too good for Ukrainian Andrei Medvedev. Oh, great tennis from Becker. Wife Barbara and son Noah didn't have too long to wait as Boris wrapped up the match 7-6, 6-1. I played fairly good, I, especially from the back, my ground strokes were excellent. A scare for men's top seed Goran Ivanisevic at the Sydney International with the Croat losing the second set and his cool against Javier Sanchez. <laughs> Ivanisevic though steadied to win in three. Also through to the quarterfinals, Pat Rafter and Sandon Stolly, while Todd Woodbridge was forced to forfeit his match suffering from a hip injury, placing him in doubt for next week's Ford Australian Open. OK, we've sorted out that technical problem. Let's go back to that charity match in Port Arthur. Port Arthur residents will never forget the pain of that dark Sunday last April, but they welcome anything that might ease it just a little. A crowd of more than 5,000 has turned up to the historic site to watch locals take on an Australian 11, a mix of cricketers and high-profile AFL footballers. If we can help in any way we can down here, it's um, good. It's, uh, it was a tragedy down here, so get the community together and just uh, have some fun out here and have the public enjoy themselves. The people here have been through some disappointment over the last year or so and it's just great to, to be able to help in any way we can. It was a timely release for the Australian cricketers and Mark Taylor in particular. His form so bad, even the locals thought they could snare his wicket. After yesterday's self-destruction against Pakistan, Taylor admitted he'd considered standing down as Australian captain. I've thought about, yeah, you know, a bit of a think about today, what's, what would be best for myself and, and Australian cricket. He knows he needs runs or his exit from the team might not be his decision. They might, they might, they might drop me. And you can say it, man, I might, I might get offended. <laughs> For the record, Taylor batted number 11 today and made just 18. Nick McArdle, Seven Nightly News. Arguably the world's greatest ever athlete, Carl Lewis is on his way to Australia to compete for the first time. The nine times Olympic gold medalist will compete in a Grand Prix athletics meet in Sydney on January 27. Athletics Australia can hardly wait to announce their impressive coup. It's great pleasure that we can announce that Lewis is starting his farewell year in the Southern Hemisphere and indeed will be competing in Sydney. The 35-year-old brought the curtain down on his Olympic career in Atlanta with a ninth gold medal, an amazing fourth win in the long jump. In Sydney, Lewis will race his favourite event, the 100 metres, 
the distance that started it all 14 years ago when he won his first world championship. Meantime, another sporting career is being relaunched, with Ian Baker Finch returning to golf at the Vic Open. Today's Pro-Am is the first time Baker Finch has played competitively in six months. I'm not going to try and have a feeling of a score or a position in the tournament, rather than just a shot by shot, keep it relaxed and uh, see the improvement. Robert Allenby, whose career has rocketed in the last year, has his own novel way of helping. I just tease him. I mean, <laughs> I mean wouldn't you tease your mates? I mean, we always tease your mates. I mean, you know, I get on the first tee and uh, I'm sure I'll say something smart to him. <laughs> and a spectacular start to the skilled Bay Classic at Port Arlington with riders pushing it to the limit around the street circuit. An early breakaway split the field as the Jayco VIS team, headed by Patrick Jonka, set the pace. His teammate Robbie McEwen took out the race, former world junior champion Dean Rogers from New South Wales falling heavily in the sprint to the line. Mark Beretta, Seven Nightly News. Whoops. And Mitch, I'll see you tomorrow night. Thanks very much, Jim. No winners from Oz Lotto this week. It jackpots to $3 million next Tuesday. Second division is worth almost $10,000. Division 3, $1,600. Fourth division, $57.80. And division 5, $29.70. But the weather seems like a winner. I'll have details next. As forecast, the morning cloud vanished by the afternoon, leaving us with more sunny weather and it looks like a magnificent weekend. The top temperature close enough to 21 degrees in the city and currently around 18 with that fresh sou'wester averaging 10 knots, humidity level on 50%. Just a few isolated drizzle patches over the coast this morning, but they also cleared. The Bureau says we can expect similar conditions tomorrow. Then, by the weekend, that large high-pressure cell should be heading directly over the Tasman, and of course with a northerly airflow, much warmer conditions. Nationwide tomorrow, apart from a few showers in Sydney and 23, all capital cities should be fine, but still no relief for Perth, with a sultry 35. Victoria tomorrow, continuing fine and sunny in the north and temperatures mainly in the high 20s. Cloudy conditions clearing to a sunny afternoon in the south, possible early drizzle about the coast. For the bays, the wind moderating tonight, then tending southeasterly tomorrow afternoon and freshening to 20 knots. And Thursday in Melbourne, almost a repeat of today. Morning cloud clearing to a mainly sunny afternoon, 21 degrees for an expected top, down to 12 tonight. And the Bureau expects our spa stable spell of weather to continue right across the weekend, warming up each day, Friday 23, Saturday 28 and Sunday a warm 33. And that's the way it is this Wednesday the 8th of January. Thanks for your company. Naomi Robson with Today Tonight Next and Chris Bath has our late news at 10.30. For now from the news team, good night. Tonight, meet the rescued French yachty making money from his story, but determined not to pay a cent towards the cost of his rescue. I think it's the, it's the ultimate selfish sport. Plus the ringing in the ears that can drive you crazy. Sometimes it just is too hard to ignore and you just have to cry yourself to sleep. Good evening, I'm Naomi Robson. Welcome to the program. First tonight, French sailor Raphael Donelli is cashing in on his story of his rescue from the treacherous Southern Ocean. But he says he's unconcerned about the cost to the Australian taxpayer. Donnelly, safely ashore in Hobart today, is one of three solo sailors world attention has been focused on recently as the RAAF mounts one of its largest civilian rescues. And shortly we'll have the latest on those continuing rescue attempts. But first, this report on the bruised but unrepentant Frenchman. Raphael, welcome to Australia. Thanks a lot. How does it feel to be back? Eh? Yes. You feeling good? Yes. Yeah, Solid feeling... ground never felt so good to this solo round the world yachtsman. Frenchman Raphael Dinelli, lucky to be alive after being plucked from raging icy seas in the Southern Ocean. Has it put you off sailing? You would, you would sail again? Yes. You'd do it again? Yeah, I need and I want to sail in again. It was this picture of Raphael Dinelli, stranded on the overturned hull of his yacht, that shocked the world and brought stinging criticisms of the dangers of solo yachting. 
very crazy, very, very bad uh, situation because the wind is very strong in the short time. The Vondi globe round the world yacht race is one of the most gruelling events of its kind. 28-year-old Danelli wasn't even meant to be racing. He didn't qualify and he lacked finance and experience. But he was allowed to set out anyway for the challenge, a challenge that almost ended in disaster. And the, the waves uh, scratch on me and it's very difficult and uh, the, the night uh, uh, just arrived and uh, I'm thinking if, if uh, nobody arrives, it's not possible for my boat and for me to, and the death is next for me. A rescue operation costing Australia more than $150,000 saved Danelli's life. That, and a fellow racer, Pete Goss. I wasn't going to leave him. I think you, you either stand by your principles or you don't. You've been improving his English and uh, he your French. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, I've taught him lots of words that will get him into trouble. He doesn't know it yet. The pair have now spent the past fortnight making for Hobart. Danelli's unexpected company shattering the loneliness and boredom of this arduous event. Yeah, bloody good to be here. It's been, uh, well, I don't know if you've heard, uh, quite an adventure, really. But all the strain ended late last night and early this morning when Danelli and his Good Samaritan ventured into the calmer waters off Hobart. A small flotilla of yachts greeted Danelli, the three life-saving beacons that guided rescuers to his stricken yacht hanging from his hand. Ironically, after surviving this ordeal, Donnelly's first minutes in Australia were spent filling in immigration and customs forms. While this early morning transfer and the simple formality of stamping immigration documents has finally ended Raphael Donnelly's two-week nightmare, for two other lone yachtsmen, it continues. They're still awaiting rescue in the freezing vastness of the Southern Ocean. Raphael Donnelly was lucky. But it's expensive rescues like this which has sparked anger and criticism about solo yacht racing from around the globe. I think it's the, it's the ultimate selfish sport. You have individuals in their yachts competing against individuals to see who is the hairiest chested uh, sailor in the world. You've been paid some money. Would you consider putting some of that money back to the Australian government who rescued you? It's not something Raphael Danelli is keen to discuss. But other competitors admit there are risks. But I don't think they should stop. They do, you know, it's like any sport at the cutting edge, there's risks involved. But there's a lot of safety and technology goes back into, back into the sport from these events. Raphael Danelli is now something of a French celebrity, having survived the race he wasn't allowed to officially enter. And he plans to sail again, soon, using tens of thousands of dollars paid for interviews by French reporters to finance his next adventure. It'll be a great story and it's probably worth more than $50,000, but um, he, he, he might do the moral thing and pay some back to us. Next, a vicious racist attack that terrified children who watched as their parents were brutally attacked. That lady, so, she, she, she like crazy. She kept, you know, uh, hitting and kicking. It was a senseless racist bashing. During the vicious attack, four terrified children huddled inside their family car watching helplessly as their parents were bashed by two other motorists. A man and a young woman abused then punched the couple at a service station. The only motive for the assault? The family are Vietnamese. Yes? They won't attack me yes. at the same time. She yes. kept hitting me uh, and uh, shouting say something very rude and she ran to me, she wanted to, uh, you know, hit me again. At the time, at the time, her, her boyfriend stood aside, didn't want to do anything else. But that lady, some, she, she, she like crazy. Lloyd Dow describing what was supposed to be a holiday of a lifetime on the Gold Coast. But today, he and his family were back in Sydney, victims of a brutal racial attack. When we, uh, all us, were in the car, she, uh, she came again, she, she came and she said, some, she said something, 
he say uh, uh, oh, 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 you uh, you are not belong here you are cook uh, we don't need you here you go back to your country and also my wife say back to her it's not your country either she kept you know uh, hitting and kicking um, want to uh, make really big trouble the Dow family had planned to make the Gold Coast their home, but no longer. Mr Dow suffered cuts and bruising in the vicious attack. His wife punched about the face and kicked in the stomach, all because of the way they looked. At the time she put her hand through the window, scratched my back and my neck very deep and very painful, but I didn't want to hit her back. If I hit her back in a minute later, I knocked her down on the floor. What happened to the Dows is a second racial attack in Queensland in as many months. Last November, a Singaporean student was brutally bashed in Brisbane. You use vulgar language, effing Asians, uh, go home, we don't need you. He flew home, unable to cope with the racial hatred. Angry ethnic groups were shocked by this latest attack. They are actions of totally irrational people, uh, people who still live in the dark ages, I would say. James Tan says controversial federal MP Pauline Hanson is largely responsible. I think so. I think so. I mean, it's very hard to put a finger on it, but uh, certainly what she has said uh, has uh, encouraged uh, those closet uh, races to come out of the woodwork and, and be more bolder. Mr Tan says while racial attacks like this one are isolated, Prime Minister Howard isn't doing enough to stop them. Prime Minister Howard has remained relatively quiet on Pauline Hanson's comments. Do you think he should have made more of a stand on the issue? I think he should have spoken out. For some reason, he's not. Your guess is as good as mine why he's not doing it. But I think, as a Prime Minister, I think he should at least, you know, speak out. Almost every other political leader has done so. Uh, he has said something about it, uh, but I think he's not saying enough. Do you yes. think Australians are racist people? No, I don't think so. No, we, uh, well, some are, but not generally, not, not the whole Australia is now. Well, it depends on, the, depends on the place. I mean, I find that within the Gold Coast, there is sometimes more of a problem than anywhere else. I guess just because of, I don't know, the, what Australians find here. But I find Australians on the whole pretty much outgoing. But some people are racism. And, but, you know, not all of them. It depends on people. The Dow family is still coming to grips with the shock of the attack. Their dream of a peaceful life on the Gold Coast shattered. Next, the $200 telephone bill Telstra tallied up to $17,000. When I first opened it up, I thought it was $169, you know. And then I looked and I thought, no, no, that's 16900 and something. Opening up the monthly phone bill is something most people dread and that's especially true for a Melbourne man who got the shock of his life when he received an account for almost $17,000. Now to begin with, Alan Hayes wrote it off as a mistake until Telstra sent a second bill for the same amount and threatened to disconnect him if he didn't pay. Alan Hayes is a bit apprehensive about using his home telephone these days and with very good reason. About two months ago, Hayes received an expensive shock when he opened up his Telstra bill and he saw that he owed almost $17,000. I just felt sick. When I first opened it up, I thought it was $169, you know, and some cents on the end of it. And I thought, that's not, a ba uh, not bad, you know. And then I looked and I thought, no, no, that's 16900 and something. Alan's first reaction was that he would have to pay the bill first and then work out the mistake with Telstra later. After I settled down for a few seconds, after that initial sort of rush of blood about it, I looked to see what the, what the breakdown was. And when I seen the 71,000 phone, metered phone calls for $17,500, I thought, no, nah, something's wrong there. In two months, I couldn't make those amount of calls. In fact, the Hayes family would have to make more than 2,300 calls every day for two months, talking non-stop for about six hours a day to ring up the $17,000 bill. Basically, we screwed up. I mean, one of our people made a mistake and uh, we've apologised to Mr Hayes. 
Telstra agreed a mistake had been made and told Hayes he'd receive a new bill with the correct amount. When he got that bill a few days ago, the bad news had got even worse. And as I slipped it up, I seen your disconnection notice. And um, I said, oh, no. And I looked over to the corner and I seen the 16900 and something dollars again. I said, I don't believe this. Hayes called Telstra again, was told the person who could fix the problem was on holidays. In the meantime, someone would try to make sure his phone wouldn't be disconnected. The number you have reached has been disconnected. But the Telstra Accounts Department has decided there are thousands of other Australians who won't be let off the hook. Earlier this week, they announced that around 100,000 people have to pay an average $50 each for local calls the company forgot to charge them. We send out about 80 million bills a year and only a, a fraction of 1% have any kind of issue raised against them. That's not much comfort for Alan Hayes, a trusted customer for more than 30 years who says he's always made a point of paying his phone bill on time. But then I'm going to have doubt as to whether that is the correct amount now. I guess we really do need to apologise to Mr Hayes, not for only making the, the mistake in the first instance, but for allowing that disconnection notice to have been issued. That clearly was wrong and we will be making amends. While Alan's phone bill will probably be fixed, the way he'll look at future bills remains changed. He's urging other customers to take a closer look. When you do get it now, don't just look at the amount you've got to pay and think, oh yeah, that's not too bad and pay it. I would query the metered calls, query your STD calls, even look at the, the, uh, the sheet that they give you on the back and see where some of those calls have been made. And we'll be back with more after this short break. I can go to bed at night and I just won't sleep at all. I'll have a loud ring in my ears all night and I won't sleep. If you can only hear me through a constant buzzing or ringing sound in your ears, you're not alone. One in seven Australians are afflicted with a condition known as tinnitus. It can affect people at any age and some sufferers even commit suicide rather than live with a constant noise in their head. Now while there's no cure, there are ways of learning how to deal with it. Oh, angry, depressed, cross. I've had two clients suicide from it. Sometimes it just is too hard to ignore and you just have to cry yourself to sleep. This is what some people have to put up with every day of their life. A constant noise in their head which won't go away. Hitting the wall, punching things, so to help. I can go to bed at night and I just won't sleep at all. I'll have a loud ring in my ears all night and I won't sleep, full stop. Tinnitus is brought on by hearing loss. So many people think it's a condition only older people get. But that's certainly not the case. Toby Curtis is 17 and he's put up with the noise since he was 13. His nightmare started after getting an ear infection which wasn't treated straight away. Went back to the doctor again, he said, oh well you've got tinnitus now, your inner ear's been scarred permanently, you'll be stuck with this for the rest of your life. If that wasn't enough, his doctor put him on a drug called minamycin to clear up his acne. Big mistake. It's a drug which can damage your hearing. Toby's tinnitus got louder and louder. It hasn't been easy. Toby's had to steer away from things most teenagers his age enjoy. Rock concerts and swimming make his condition worse. Studying, though, has been one of his biggest hurdles. When there's quiet, absolute silence, it's very hard to study or read or anything. As the tinnitus, you, you notice it more when there's no background noise. During his tertiary entrance exams, Toby had to get special permission to use a Walkman, so the music would block out the noises in his head. He's sure it saved him from bombing out. I would have made lots of mistakes. Um, I would have had a headache by the end of the paper, concentrating so hard, trying to block out the ringing, then concentrating on doing the papers. Yeah, it would have been a bit of a shambles. Music used as a masker, which is a, a technique for uh, counteracting the, the noises of the tinnitus, is very good. David McGrath keeps his Walkman handy. He uses it every day to help him cope with his tinnitus, which he's had for 10 years. One morning I woke up and complained about the noises in, that I was hearing, and my wife couldn't hear them. So I said, the cicadas are loud this morning. She said, there aren't any. 
David's 70 and it's not surprising he has the condition. He's a retired engineer, so he's had a lifetime of working with loud machinery and explosives. And loud noises are the most common cause of tinnitus. Before I learned to live with it, I got very depressed and um, worried about it. Uh, but since I was sort of came to terms with it and uh, able to cope, it doesn't affect me mentally very badly at all. David and Toby aren't alone. Barbara Streisand is another sufferer and it's believed Paul Keating also has the constant ringing in his ears. Tinnitus is pretty common. One in seven people suffer from it. No one used to talk about it very much in case people thought they were crazy. After all, we are talking about noises in your head no one else can hear. But lately, more research has been done and a lot more is now known about tinnitus. Damage to the cochlea causes an unusual electrical impulse pattern to leave the ear. And so tinnitus actually lives in the pathways connecting the ears to the brain, not the ear itself, which is what we used to believe. Paul Davis is an audiologist. He too has tinnitus, so he understands what his patients go through. Over the last few okay, years, okay. he's done a lot of I'll research into the problem and how to make it bearable. Ear infections, the ear surgery, you know, middle ear problems, uh, explosions, head injury, whiplash, occasionally medication, uh, anything which damages the pathways, anything which damages the nervous system can cause tinnitus. Work out what makes the tinnitus better and what makes it worse. And one of the most common things that makes tinnitus worse is stress. So stress management is crucial. There isn't a cure for tinnitus, but Paul teaches people how to deal with it using tinnitus retraining therapy, where sounds are constantly fed into the ear. It retrains the brain to ignore the noise. If we keep feeding the right sounds back into the ear, it winds the tinnitus right back to the point where people no longer hear it or have to strain to hear. The retraining might take up to two years, but Paul says it's certainly worth the effort. It really can ruin some people's lives, so it's very important to be able to give them all these different tools and strategies. Um, so um, there is hope. I think the best way to handle it is to realise, well, I've got it. There's no point in crying about it. Might as well find out what I can do to help me with it and just get on with it. Hmm. Well, tomorrow night on the program, a day in the life of some of our top jockeys. Are they underpaid and overworked or simply just spoilt show ponies? $65 a ride is just not enough to put your life on the line. At the end of the day, a jockey doesn't have to be a jockey. He can take a job somewhere else. But Ginty has raced to the lead past a 200. There's a fall, solitary note, lost the rider in the... What would you say to would it say your, your claim's not worth it? I'd say grab the boots, have a go yourself. I've been up in the front of a field and knowing that I've, as I'm falling, that I've probably got about 12 or 13 horses to gallop over the top of me and I'm really in the Lord's hands. You know, I'm at his mercy, really. Call me King Squad. Go! Oh, Thompson's come down. Thompson's fallen in the home straight. One went over the top of him. Abra caught clear. And, and we'll have that story for you tomorrow night. I hope you can join us. Until then, take care and good night.